and we are still trucking in the uh, in the topic of thermodynamics, and we're slowly making head. And this is almost going to be the very last video about this topic. And I'm going to make a slight clarification, or I'm just going to add something else. And everything that I'm really going through are just things that can appear in different fashions in an exam. So I'm going to make sure I cover everything. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Gibbs free energy is. And this is something that maybe you know from chemistry. I'm going to talk about coupled reactions. And I'm also going to talk about chemical potential. And this has a minimal that is not necessarily very very intuitive to it. So I'm going to explain what the chemical potential of a given substance is. So let's get started. And the clarification I want to make about entropy, and again, it is, it is easy to say that the second, the second law says, the second law here, second law, second law says that the entropy of the universe keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. And what I can do is if I have a very disordered room, I can invest energy. I can invest energy and decrease the entropy, decrease the entropy. Just like I had a bunny before, a bunny, that ate, ate some, some, I don't know, whatever it is that bunnies eat in the wild. Let's just say it gained some ATP, it got some energy, it got some calories, and then it, it decreased its entropy. So this is really, this is really how I can decrease my entropy. So let's consider what happens if I have an isolated system. And this is why I'm going to explain to you, get an intuition as to why the entropy of a, an, an isolated system cannot decrease. This is an isolated system. And let's say it has a given, a given state of entropy, a given entropy. Its entropy is whatever. And I want to decrease, I want to decrease my entropy. For that, I need energy. But the characteristic of an isolated system is that I can't, I can't, I can't put matter into it or take matter out of it. And I also can't, can't put energy into it or take energy out of it. So there's no exchange of matter or heat. And if this energy and if this system can't take in energy, it's not going to be able to decrease its entropy. So this is the idea. If the bunny wouldn't be able to feed on its environment, it wouldn't be able to decrease its entropy, and it will die, <laughs> essentially. But basically, this is why the entropy of an isolated system, of an isolated system, cannot, cannot decrease. Cannot decrease. This is why. And I also want to touch on the idea that you can think of entropy, entropy, and I'm going to draw entropy, as tax. And what do I mean by that? If I take some energy, this is energy, and I perform a, a process, process, some of, some of the energy that I put towards the process is going to be dissipated, and is going to be dissipated as entropy. So, sorry, some of the energy, did I say entropy? Some of the energy that I use to propel this process is going to be lost as entropy. And that means that if, let's just say, I'm putting fuel in my car, and I'm going to make my car move from one place to the other, so this is all good and dandy, my car is moving, but some of the energy is going to be lost as heat, because I know that when I put gas in my car and gas explodes, it also generates heat. And heat is not really what is moving my car, it is more the kinetic energy that is that is caused by the expansion, the rapid expansion in the pistons. So I'm losing some of this energy. And this whole idea of entropy being a tax relates to the idea of the, uh, how does it call the perpetuum, perpetuum of the second, second, uh, second type, I believe it is. And again, this is not necessarily something that you may be asked about in an exam. I'm just explaining something that was in the lecture slide. Perpetuum of the second type saying that I can take certain amount of energy, or I can take certain amount, certain amount of energy, and turn it into work fully. I'm going to have some tax that I need to pay to my entropy. I can't take all this energy and transfer it to work. And if you don't have an easy time understanding it, let's just say I have a lamp. This is my lamp. This is my lamp here. And it's sitting on my desk. And let's just say I have some solar panels here. I have some solar panels here. These are my solar panels. And they can, they can receive solar energy and 
make electricity from it, and I can connect my solar panel back to my light. And I'm taking this, this lamp, and I'm turning it on in some way. And this lamp is turned on, and it's shining its own light on the solar panel. And this solar panel generates energy, and then this energy is fed back to this lamp. And this is going to keep on going, but then it is going to suddenly stop because the lamp is not going to get enough energy. And you're asking, how come it stopped? This lamp kept feeding on its own. Well, the idea is that we know that some of this energy, of this light energy, is dissipated as heat out to the environment. Some is lost. Some is lost as entropy tax. So this is the idea of the perpetual mobile of the second type. I'm always going to have to lose some energy. I can't take all my energy and, and fully turn it into work. That's the idea. Hopefully I've explained it. But if you don't understand it, it's not super, super important as much as the other ideas that relate to entropy. So we're going to talk a little bit about Gibbs free energy. And Gibbs free energy really says, Gibbs free energy helps us answer the, the question of, of what, is, what is going to be, what is the direction of this process. Of this process. And what I mean by that, and I gave an example before, is let's just say I have a valley here, and I have, and I have a rock here. I can bring a physicist, and that physicist will say, oh, there's this process that can occur, and this process that can occur. And then that physicist is going to sit down and calculate that the Gibbs free energy of the process of going downhill is going to have some negative value, and the Gibbs free energy of going uphill is going to have some positive value. And what we know is that when Gibbs free energy, Gibbs free energy is negative, that, that, uh, that event or that process is going to occur spontaneously. And when the Gibbs free energy is positive, that event is going to require energy. And again, when the Gibbs free energy is zero, then I have equilibrium. Or in a, in a thermodynamic standpoint, I'm going to have a, re a reversible event. Reversible event. Now, it's good that I took this physicist, because if he hadn't calculated this, I probably wouldn't know that this, this little rock is going to roll downhill. But the idea is that we can actually solve for whether or not different processes are going to require energy or are going to happen at random. And what, what, what type of processes occur at random? Let's just say the diffusion of gas occurs at random. And what requires energy? Let's just say if I take this car here, and I want this car to, to uh, travel one kilometer, I know that I'm going to have to invest energy. I'm going to have to invest quite a lot of energy. I'm going to have to put gas in this engine, and the ingestion is going to cause combustion. So this, this process of this, this car moving is going to have a very high Gibbs free energy, just like this stone uh, rolling uphill. That's the idea. That's the idea of Gibbs free energy. And now we're going to touch on the chemical, or rather, couple reactions. Are we perfect? Couple reactions, even better, even better. So what I can do is I already took, I already took my car that I know that I want to move it forward. I want to move it forward, and I know that it has a very high Gibbs free energy. It doesn't occur spontaneously, and if it did, maybe our lives would have been a little bit easier. So what I can do is if I had a certain process that had a very, very low Gibbs free energy. It occurs, at, uh, it occurs spontaneously, and it maybe releases a lot of energy. Then I can couple the two and make the first, the first event that would not occur spontaneously actually occur. And we know this from everyday life, that gasoline, when, that when gasoline is, is burned, it has a very, very low Gibbs free energy. If I put gasoline in the vicinity of fire, it is going to spontaneously combust. And it, that, that event is going to occur 100 times out of 100, I'm assuming, although I'm not going to go ahead and do it 100 times because it's not as safe as some people would think. So if I took gasoline's negative, negative uh, Gibbs free energy and I couple it with the positive free energy, uh, Gibbs free energy that my car has, maybe I can get my car to move. Maybe I can get my car to move. And the I believe that the... Um, 
the example given in our presentation was something along, if I had a cliff and I had rocks falling out of it, I had rocks falling out of it, and I had a, and I had a well here, I had a well right next to it, and I have a bucket of water that I want to lift, I want to lift, maybe I can use, maybe I can use a rope here that is connected to another device that can spin when rocks tumble on top of it, and this device is going to spin when, when rocks are thrown at it, and then this is going to spin, and then the bucket is going to go up. And this is a really good example, but for me, putting gasoline in a car and using the engine to move the gasoline forward is kind of a little bit more intuitive than this. But either, either example is good to explain how I can couple a positive Gibbs free energy event that needs energy in a negative with a negative Gibbs free energy process that occurs spontaneously to propel this positive Gibbs free energy event. And being that we're talking about Gibbs free energy, we need to explain what chemical potential is. And basically what chemical potential is, and I'm going to write the definition, and then I'm going to explain it because maybe the definition is not really intuitive. The chemical potential is basically the Gibbs free energy, the Gibbs free energy of one mole of a given substance. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? If I have one mole of gasoline, gasoline, I know that this one mole would have a negative, a certain negative Gibbs free energy. Let's just say that the Gibbs free energy for that mole is negative a thousand units. Negative a thousand units. So if I add one mole of gasoline, uh, I, oh, if I had one mole of gasoline, I can decrease, uh, I can decrease the Gibbs free energy of another process. And I'm going to just throw, I'm just going to throw that same example. I had a car, and the Gibbs free energy uh, calculation of this car driving one kilometer, the Gibbs, the Gibbs free energy is plus, um, let's say, 100,000 units. 100,000 units. <coughs> and at this point, I can solve for how many moles of gasoline am I going to need to propel this event. Well, I'm going to have to have 100 moles. 100 moles, moles of gasoline. And why is that? If I have 100 moles of gasoline, and each mole has 1,000, a negative 1,000 Gibbs free energy, I'm going to have 100 times 1,000, I'm going to have 100,000 negative units of Gibbs free energy that I can couple with this event. So the idea is basically, how much energy can I get from one mole of substance? Is its chemical potential. How much energy is it going to give me? Or how much Gibbs free energy is it associated with? And it just so happens that I found a nice website. Where is it? No, this is my Facebook. Uh, da -da 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 -da. There it is. There we go. We have the uh, physics.info portal, the physics hyper textbook. And this this nice this nice website. I've been I've been uh, I've been looking at it for a while. Its address is physics.info, and we have the chemical potential of let's just say diesel fuel. This 45.3 what is this unit? Megajoules per, per kilogram. So I can see that um, I can see that the combustion of uh, the combustion of carbon, or I can see that gasoline is actually the uh, the gasoline used in automotive industry has a 45.8 megajoules per kilogram of chemical potential. And I, I obviously I can I can actually take the megajoules per kilogram and and uh, solve for how much is it in a mole, but that, that is not really used for industrial processes. But the idea is that every, every spontaneous event or every, every uh, energetic substance can decrease a Gibbs free energy. So if I have gasoline, gasoline, it has the ability to decrease Gibbs free energy because it has negative Gibbs free energy. Perfect, and I already learned that. That means that this gasoline, one mole of gasoline, one mole of gasoline, is going to have some sort of chemical potential to change, to change the Gibbs free energy of an event. So this is this is this definition: the Gibbs free energy 
of one mole of this substance. And that is what it means. Hopefully you found this helpful. And in the next video, all we have left to review, really, I believe, is the osmosis section. Not really a thermodynamic related uh, issue per se, but we're going to put it within the same realm. So I'll see you there.